And there we are. Hello everyone, Brent here with Bring Your Own Tools. And today is a little bit special, a little bit different because normally I would be posting a video this week, but lo and behold, a few things happened and I was not able to get a project out. And my yearly goal uh, this year specifically is to actually get a video out every single week, no matter what. So instead we're doing a fun Q and A session. And luckily for me, I have Leah with us from C Jane Drill. Hello, Leah. Hey buddy, how you doing? I'm doing great. How about you? Oh, I'm loving it. I'm 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 loving today. The weekends are always great, you know. I know it's good to finally actually get to relax for a minute. Hopefully, you can relax today because today is actually somewhat of a day off for me. I'm not actually working on any projects, which is nice, unless it's, they're more honey do list type projects. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that was the case for me. Yeah, exactly. But in any case, uh, everyone just wanted to say thank you for joining us. This is going to be a fun little Q and A session. Whether you have home improvement questions or else. If you have a question about a home improvement project that you're gonna be doing in the near future, give us a call or shoot us a question in the box below because we'd love to see and answer a few questions for you if you have them. But Leah, first off, let's ask, you know, what do you have project-wise going on right now? Well, um, let's see, what do I have? I have a trailer build and I'm, I'm uh, modifying the trailer to uh, really fit my needs. You know what? A lot of people don't realize that uh, utility trailers are really great investment and pretty inexpensive as well. You know, you can find a utility trailer kit for, you know, just a few hundred dollars. I might have to do that one day since I have just so many tools and every single project I do, it seems like I'm taking quite a few of them with me. So a trailer probably would be coming in handy at a certain point. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you know, it's interesting. I didn't realize that uh, Harbor Freight sold a trailer that, and they send you the title work for it and everything so you could register for the plates. I think that's yep. pretty cool, isn't it? It's pretty yep. cool. Exactly. Yeah. And, and we're finally getting a few people in. Uh, if you guys are, thank you all for joining us. And first off, thank you for joining us. And secondly, where are you from? Let us know in the comment section where you guys are from because we would love to know where everyone is actually joining in on this fun little live stream on Saturday. But we already, in all honesty, look at that. We already have a question from Tom. Leah, so if I'm gonna bring it up right now, and it's a f good one, good, nice, easy one. It's Tom says, hello, greetings from Costa Rica. No, or, it's, it's Croatia. Excuse me, Croatia, excuse me. Cro it's Croatia. beautiful, beautiful <laughs> in Croatia. I wanna know, do you use more paint in a paint sprayer or painting by roll or brush? I'm interested in buying paint sprayer and always have that question in my mind. Thanks. Well, uh, do you want to answer that first, Leah? I can I can chime in. And this is what my experience has been. You use a lot less paint using a paint sprayer. Um, you know, rollers, it, it kind of depends on the nap. If you've got a heavy nap roller and um, you're going over texture, you're going to use a lot of paint. If you're, for example, painting a door, um, then you want a real um, fine, uh, smooth coat, and the nap is very, very small, so you're going to use less paint. But uh, my experience has been, uh, you know, paint sprayer uses less paint. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. And in, in all honesty, Tom, I've used both numerous times. And for paint spraying, when I use paint spraying, it's mainly because I have a large project on my hands. So if I'm doing house guaranteed paint sprayer will save your bacon in so many different ways, time-wise and effort-wise. So for larger scale projects, definitely use a paint sprayer. For smaller scale, if you're just painting a wall in a room uh, or the ceiling, I would always normally use a paint roller and paint brush just because it's easy. You don't, you're not gonna make a mess. You don't have to tape off everything because that's the real thing you have to think about. With a paint sprayer, you're taping off a significant amount. So you're doing a lot of time and effort just to tape off everything. You are saving time when you're applying it because a paint sprayer will take 
you know, minutes versus hours versus a paintbrush and, and paint roller. But keep that in mind when you're doing that type of project. Can, can I say something else uh, about that, Brett? And because you brought up a really good point about the setup for a paint sprayer if you're doing an interior and all the stuff that you have to cover up, the windows, the flooring, any kind of baseboard mm -hmm. or wood, uh, paneling, there's a lot of cover up. But what I will say, plus you have to wear a respirator, it, a respirator, sometimes a jumpsuit, uh, but it's quick, you know? Yep. You it's can so spray quick. it on it, an entire it's so house. <laughs> You can spray out an entire house interior in a day. I I was literally, it's, it brings up a funny story just because there's a neighbor in my neighborhood that they were rolling on paint on their exterior of their house. And I was like, I have not seen that in a long time. <laughs> okay. They probably spent, it took them weeks weeks to finish their project just because they were rolling the entire thing and it just takes up so much time to try and roll on paint especially because with sight and everything there's so many unique angles in a paint sprayer you can get any angle you want so quickly and easily and then you can just back roll or take a brush in a few small areas and that's it well did you say something to your neighbors <laughs> Did no, you want to? Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> okay. they, they, they weren't I, my direct neighbors. Yeah, if they I were my direct folks, neighbors, then yes, yeah, I would for sure. I've seen folks do that with rolling, rolling the outside of the lap siding, but then they would back brush, you know, yep. rolling and back brush. Yep. But oh, I, look at that. Okay. Well, first, we got to go back to. We have someone from Portugal. That's pretty amazing. Thank you for joining us. Well, who where else we got? We got Colorado. There we go. Josh from Colorado. And we have uh, Stefan from Vancouver, Washington. Oh, local. There we go. At least for me now. Since, mm -hmm. since Leah had to move out of the Pacific Northwest. I miss you already. All of Washington misses you. Oh, well, I'm here. I'm here today. <laughs> here in spirit, I'm right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, Stefan also has a question for us. So just curious about the best way to pull up cheap tile flooring from a kitchen floor with mosaic. 19... Mastic. It's mastic. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Mastic. Sorry. Mm -hmm. My dyslexia is apparently off today. but uh, Or on, I should say. <laughs> 1955 house that I am remodeling or redoing. The kitchen from the floor up. Anyways, do you have a specific thing you have in mind first, Leah? I think it all depends on a couple things. Um, are we talking about ceramics? Are we talking about ceramic tile? Are we talking about porcelain? Are we talking about vinyl composite? Um, are we talking about a tile made with asbestos? See, it. When I'm looking, 1955, that's tricky. Yeah, that so is, she, that's tricky. So it, it really kind of all depends on what the tile is made of. Yes, um, Stefan, can you reiterate that if you're still with us? What type of tile is it? Because, yeah, like you noted, it does say mastic. So I'm thinking it might be more of a vinyl potentially. Well, you know, those asbestos tiles, they were applied with mastic. Exactly. So that's, why I'm, that's why I'm that's, leaning towards that way. And you know there there is a um oh here we go oh okay. Stefan already noted says side note no asbestos in flooring oh um, that's good but what what is I it? already had it tested great is it is it linoleum what is oh, it oh here he just put it thank you Stefan vinyl. Oh, vinyl okay so I actually have a good a couple good things for you on this so personally I have removed vinyl numerous times and it's not fun it's never fun and the good thing obviously that you tested it so thank you so much for testing that because yeah, you do want to make sure you. that there's no asbestos in it before you start removing it 
So since you don't have asbestos, great news there. And the one thing that I've used that has done a really nice job at, at removing vinyl flooring is actually a multi-tool, a vibrating oscillating multi-tool and having a flat blade on the front. And there's specific blades that you can get that are literally six inches wide and you attach it to your multi-tool, you get underneath it and you just start going to town and it vibrates it so perfectly. And you can literally just take one hand, peel one side and as you're cutting you can, can just continuously pull it back and it makes really quick work of it i would also recommend cutting especially if it's sheet vinyl it could be just re regular small pieces of vinyl but if it's sheet vinyl make sure you score the sheet vinyl first because you can take it up in sections versus one large piece that's a great idea brent that sounds like a video <laughs> there, <laughs> did I do a video on that? There's so many videos I've done. <laughs> you know, I want to say this about uh, asbestos tile, because I think a lot of people forget that floor coverings, you know, they have asbestos in them too, especially during that time. But did you know that Armstrong uh, has a catalog online where you can look up various uh, tile patterns to find out if that tile contains asbestos or not. So that's a great resource for people and it's free. You know, it's like I said, it's Armstrong and it is a uh, catalog. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, it has come back to me. I have done a video on this because I did a video on my favorite tool and that was the multi-tool. And I did note in that video how I removed asbestos tile or not asbestos tile, but vinyl tile uh -huh. with a multi-tool. So I will make sure and uh, leave a link in uh, the comments section after this live stream for sure. That's a great trick, man. <laughs> anyway, we got another question. We got Josh. Would you be worried to make a coffee table using epoxy around only one and a half inches thick? Well, uh, I am the epoxy person, right, Leah? Would you like me to chime in on this one? You go for it, buddy. <laughs> uh, well, Josh, I certainly would say that, that if it's a one half, half inches thick, I would say comfortably that that should be enough. It's uh, depending on the type of epoxy you're using, some might differ versus others, but if it's thick setting epoxy, it should be very strong once it cures properly. So with thick setting epoxy, it normally will cure within a, f a 48 hour period fully, but at that point, it should be plenty strong to carry a coffee table. You know, you're not trying to make something that people are walking on. So if it's a coffee table, you should be completely fine with uh, a thickness of one and a half inches thick. Let's see if we have any other questions at the moment. Tom says, thank you. No problem, Tom. You have somebody there from Finland. Did you see that? From Finland? No, yeah. I haven't. What's his name? Or what's their name? Um, you just scrolled past them. Oh, here we go. Uh, Fergal Walsh. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Fergal Walsh. There you go. Is there a good way to take up a single small uh, ceramic floor tile in the middle of a bathroom floor? Ooh, that is a good question. And uh, Leah, would you, uh, do you have any advice on that before I chime in? Well, generally what I do is I, I score it and use a chisel and a hammer and do a light tap. And then you're able to break it, break it up. Yep. That's generally what I do. Yeah. So I would definitely suggest uh, obviously scoring it first for sure, just because you score it, it's just going to make it a little bit more prone to breaking. And uh, especially if it's a ceramic tile, I would for sure go around. It, it depends on if you're trying to re-grout that area as well. So if you're, tr if you st need to re-grout the area, I would suggest trying to remove the grout around that tile first, because that way you're putting less pressure on the tiles around it. And then, and then actually chiseling it out because I've, 
I've done it in the past and it ha it is difficult just to make sure you're not trying to damage the tiles that are adjacent to it. But if, uh, if you can remove the grout first, take the tile out. And when I try and take out the thin set, there normally is a certain amount of thin set I want to remove that's dried on there before I install it. Because if you don't, then the, the height level might be different. So I, again, I use my, uh, my, uh, excuse me, my multi-tool, because there's a vibrating attachment on my multi-tool that can actually easily remove thin set, and it's it's perfect for that. So if you do have a multi-tool, get one of those, it vibrate the excess thin set out of there, add, th add new thin set, tile, done deal after you grout. Those tools are great for so many things, aren't they? <laughs> there's a reason why it's called a multi-tool, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's literally my favorite tool just because there's so many versatile aspects that you can use it for. Um, oh, did Josh say for, oh, so Josh did say it was for a dining table. Okay. Uh, Josh, how big is it? Because let me, let us know how big it is because that. It, and is it only epoxy? Is it only epoxy? There's no wood in it. It's just epoxy. If you can add that in there, please do. Because that I definitely have curiosity factor now since it's not, it's, <laughs> I thought you said coffee table. No, it's a table in a cafe. Okay. Makes more sense. <laughs> Here we go. From Portugal, in your opinion, what's the best way to cover plywood edges? Don't really like shop edge banding. Thanks. Wow, that's interesting. I love yeah. banding. It's so easy just to iron it on. <laughs> I you know? know, right? <laughs> but on. you know, they could use a you know quarter round or half round or something like that if they wanted to dress up an edge. But that just seems like a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. The so. Uh, I wonder what he's making with plywood to try and make, is it for, I don't think we have an answer. If you want to let us know what you're actually trying to make so we can give a, a better answer. But in all honesty, if you're trying to cover it some, with something different other than edge banding, then you could, um, I'm thinking of just off the top of my head, maybe make very thin slices of a different type of wood that's a different color. So maybe a nice walnut and put them through your table saw, cut you know quarter inch thick strips, and then you can actually glue those in place. And it, I can see a nice variance between the two different grain structures and two different colors of the wood, which would make a nice unique edge around a generic piece of plywood. By the way, Leah, have you been experiencing the increases of uh, price of uh, materials in your neck of the woods right now? It's crazy, man. Right? It is. I spent insane. $10, $10 on a two by four. No. It was no. pressure treated. It was pressure treated, you know, for <laughs> my. Uh. For my um, it's still two by four for, for my trailer build. Yeah, I mean, really, it's crazy, isn't it? And the it sheet is. of plywood I purchased was sixty six dollars. That's insane. crazy. It's crazy right now, and it's just the hopefully it steadies the ship eventually. Just because there was uh, there's just such a shortage of materials, so they're just charging whatever they can at the moment, and. You know what? I heard it wasn't a shortage. I heard that it was transportation and trucking. I guess you could which, look at it as a shortage, yeah. Which could be the case, too, because the vast majority of our materials here in the United States are do come from Canada. At least not, maybe not the vast majority, but there's a large percentage of materials that we purchase from Canada that they bring over. And I'm sure the trucking aspects have been a little crazy throughout the pandemic. <laughs> Yeah, man. Yeah. Everybody's experiencing it. Yeah. All right. Let's see. I think we got a few more questions here. Starfire. There, there is a name. I like it. <laughs> How do you make a footboard? My uh, my footboard was accidentally thrown out fr uh, from my storage unit. It's all walnut wood. What would 
excuse me, what would would match walnut too expensive? <laughs> so footboard, I'm trying to think what, uh, do you know exactly what she's referring to when she says footboard? Or I have no idea. Right? I was hoping that you knew. But if I, <laughs> you know, if I was going to just throw something out, a uh, wood wise that's that's easy oh. to work with. That's here easy we go. To Perfect, work. Star. Thank you so much, Star. I forgot okay. to mention it's a king platform bed. Oh, okay. Well, anyways, so king platform bed footboard. Well, I mean, Star. I don't know if you found my channel through the bed platform that I just built. Possibly because seriously. That is literally what I just built for my brother, a platform bed that's made out of walnut. And it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Absolutely love it. And I would push you towards walnut, but I definitely know firsthand how expensive walnut can be because just the three pieces of walnut that I purchased for the platform of the bed itself was three, four hundred dollars just for that. Crazy. It so, is expensive, but man, it was beautiful, beautiful bed, and you should place a link. It was, place it was absolutely gorgeous, and he, let's just say my brother's a very happy camper right now. <laughs> I heard that it was beautiful, but what would you suggest? I'm thinking to myself, and I think personally, there are some cheaper lumber's out there, and I would suggest staining it. So there are specific stains out there that say right on there, walnut. So making maybe getting more of an oak or even you know I wouldn't suggest any type of poplar or anything like that. Yeah, but it, it it stains poorly. It works yeah. well. It works well, but it doesn't it doesn't stain well. Exactly. Exactly. So what about a pine? Pine is you know. Yeah, pine pine well. would definitely work well. It's strong, and I think it definitely takes stain well too. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that's help star that, uh, that is unfortunate that they threw it out, but, uh, there are ways to get around it specifically stains. So try, try a few things out. Just make sure you try whatever you material you use, make sure you have a test piece first and you test out a few different colors and a few different amounts of stain, because you don't want to all of a sudden have this big, beautiful piece of wood and then stain it. And then you don't like the stain. So try and make uh, try and test sample out the stains first before applying it. I think we had a few. Oh, well, we, uh, there Canada is also suffering from a t tree. Oh, really interesting. Well, that might have something to do with it. Yep. That definitely quite, uh, quite possibly could. Huh? That's crazy. Thanks for, uh, thanks for that note there. Interesting. Let's see here. Emily. Emily has a good question. Oh, I like the little uh, emoji there too, Emily. Uh, when <laughs> when doing 10 foot by 10 foot room baseboards, do you buy 12 foot boards or eight foot and just join together two as needed? Well, I definitely have my answer. That's a good uh, question. Leah. That is a great question. Leah, would you like to take that one at least first? Well, what I will say is this. I like to use the longest boards as possible. Otherwise, you, you have to make what's called a scarf joint. And those scarf joints, they're not, they're supposed to, well, they're not invisible to the eye. Uh, they're supposed to be um, not seen as easily as if you were to make, um, you know, just a straight cut. Mm -hmm. So, so if you're going to use a shorter board, you're, you're going to have to do a scarf joint. Um, and it's a cut on the diagonal. It, you could look it up. It, they're easy to do. You know, it's easy. It's an easy technique. But I personally like to use the longest board possible. Yep. So that's my opinion. Yeah, Emily, I, I completely agree with what Leah stated is that, um, and especially with the fact that normal baseboard material isn't that expensive. So having a nice cohesive long piece that's all one piece is very beneficial, mainly for two reasons. One specifically is the eye catching appeal of it. So first and foremost, when I do when I when I have to do an edge where it's like more of a 45, 45 kind of connecting together, it doesn't 
it never looks good. It always stands out to me no matter what you do and no matter how perfect that cut is, it always stands out to me at a certain point. And two, it's sometimes obviously harder to hit, uh, hit studs. So if you have one long piece that you're going from wall to wall, you know you're going to be able to hit a stud on both ends because there's going to be a stud at the end of a wall. But if you have a break in a certain point and you have to fill those joints in, you're not guaranteed to hit a stud at that location. So just keep that in mind as well. You, you agree with that, Leah? Absolutely. Okay, thanks. Oh, we got uh, we got some more information from California Girl Footboard. I would contrast the walnut with a light board. I did that with oak and cherry wood on a bathroom vanity. The oak makes both the darker woods pop. Ooh, I like that. It does, yeah. Thanks that for the suggestion, there, California yeah. Girl. Appreciate that. Ooh, oh, and we just have to give a shout out. Thank you. I love that. Love hearing that. Make sure you check out Leah at CJ and Drill as well, because normally we're doing this on her channel, on her channel. But today we're doing it on BYOT uh, as a fun, special treat because the fact that Brent could not get a video out this week. It's been a very long week, everyone. It's truly been a long week, but I assured myself that every single week I would get a video out no matter what. And to this day, I have gotten a video out every single week this entire year. So I'm very proud of that because some of these videos do take quite a bit of time. So with the fact that Leah was so generous with her time to make oh. sure she joined in in the BYOT family today, which is just fun. And it's just a pleasure, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's just fun, one, just to sit down and be able to talk with my friend. But two, both of us, we both uh, obviously uh, have the same mantra of our channel is all about trying to help others learn how to build and create. And f normally it's just project based. Uh, you know, trying to help others, but it's really fun and beneficial to us of really giving back to people live because in all honesty, maybe we can't answer every single question to the best of our ability, but, or excuse me, to the, <laughs> maybe we can't answer every single question out there, but we will answer it to the best of our ability. And with that, hopefully it helps you all out there as well on your own projects. Let's see here. What other what other ones do we have? Oh, well, we we'll, let's go back to this one. So real quickly, would you be able to advise what is the best protective finish for Doug fir wood when used ex externally for outdoor furniture? That's a good question. <laughs> do you have one for that, Leah? You know, finishes are always changing because technology is always changing. But one of my favorites is spar varnish. I'm sure spar, you have your spar your varnish. Spar varnish is a is a marine varnish. Mm -hmm. so, I, I don't think I've ever used that varnish before. Everybody's got their favorites, right? <laughs> well, in all honesty, it's one of those questions where it should be an easy question to ask or to ask me because, you know, I, I use a lot of finishes and use a lot of woods, but in all honesty, I don't use a lot of finishes for outdoor use. You know, the, I've done plenty of decks and plenty of fences, but I never use any finishes for them because I like more of the natural look as well as I use more of a, a composite Trex uh, type product for the decking itself. So personally, I don't know uh, too much about exterior finishes, but I would say certain, obviously a marine grade finish would work best. I don't know if it will work well on a Douglas fir material. Do you know about a mar marine grade finish on Douglas fir and how that would well, interact this, with? This, this, this is what I will say about that. And that is it's expensive. And there are less expensive products that you can use. And then uh, nowadays, everybody likes to use water-based water -based, um, finishes because the cleanup is so much easier than something that's oil-based. So it really depends upon um, personal preference, I think. That's what I think. 
Yeah, no, that's great advice. So thank you so much. And hopefully that helps. Here's a good one. Martin from Germany. Look at that. We are with people all over the place and joining us today. That's amazing. Love that. Uh, thanks all or thanks a lot for all the inspiration. Where did you build your skills up? How did you come to your YouTube journey? What <laughs> was it planned? Last question. <laughs> What's the most loved tool in your set? Oh man, these are some great questions. And Leah, I think we go all day on these questions, but- You got uh, a great story about how you got involved. Yeah, do you wanna go first or would you like me to? No, you go ahead, go on, go on. You've got a great story. <laughs> well, Martin, I do have a unique story, but I think everyone has a unique story on YouTube. So specifically with my story, I bought a house back in 2010 and it was just what we would call in the States an ugly duckling because it just needed everything. It was, it, it was very rough. I literally gutted the entire thing and started from the ground up. And personally, I had a construction background, but I didn't know how to do everything on my on my own to how to completely remodel an entire house. So I started using YouTube quite often to learn how to do things throughout the remodeling process of my home. And at a certain point, I could not find a video on a specific subject and I was just looking everywhere for it. I couldn't figure out why in the world can I not find a video for this process? And I said to my girlfriend at the time, now wife, you know, maybe I should do a YouTube video and YouTube's helped me so much. Maybe I could do another YouTube video and I can help someone else out there. And it wasn't the first video I did, but it was kind of the first video that, or it was the idea that was generated in my mind of, hey, maybe I should do a YouTube video. And of course that one video led to another, led to another. I finally did the project that I was seeking, which was how to grow grass. And I couldn't find a video on how to grow grass from start to finish, from literally dirt and weeds to full on grass. And of course, apparently that was needed in that uh, on YouTube because that is still to this day, one of my most popular videos on the entire channel. So that's always very, uh, very heartwarming that I was able to help all those people out there because it probably has, you know, 1.5 million views already, which is crazy. Would you like to uh, talk about your, uh, you didn't say what your favorite tool was, Brent. Okay, well, we, okay. I, I'll, 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 I'll go back and forth with uh, <laughs> with mine. So first off, of, I think I already mentioned it, obviously the multi-tool, favorite tool, multi-tool. Oh, multi yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just so diverse. You can do so many different things with it. So it always love the multi-tool. As far as where did you build your skills? That's the fun part is that with anything, it's all about learning and wanting to learn. So that's really what drives me just as a person is I'm always trying to build upon myself and my skill set. And with this aspect, I've talked about this numerous times and within my own skill set, it's all about wanting to learn and build and creating. And every single day I try and learn something new. And with those little increments, those small little increments will gradually bring you up. And hopefully at a certain point you can call yourself a master DIYer like Leah, but it takes <laughs> years and years to do. But in all honesty, it's it's amazing what you're able to accomplish, especially if you have the mindset of never f fearing on a project. And that's what why I love the construction mindset so much because there's always a problem and you always have to work through that problem. And the fun thing about learning on YouTube as well as trying to teach others how to learn is you're always trying to build upon yourself and try new things because on my channel specifically, I'm always doing a different project every single week. And not always do I know, uh, not I certainly don't know how to do every single project from the get go. So I personally have to teach myself sometimes how to do something and then I get to teach you all. <laughs> You did some great projects too. <laughs> There's been some unique ones, that's for sure. <laughs> Anyways, Leah, let's go back to you. Let's let's see. You want to talk a bit about how you started on YouTube? 
Well, you know, I was a trades instructor. We've had this discussion. What I realized was I realized they weren't teaching shop in school anymore. So you, you had a lot of people that they were coming out of high school. And <clears throat> one thing that uh, we teach folks is that um, um, doing an apprenticeship is the other four year degree. It's just that, you know, there's no student debt. And I'm a big proponent of um, apprenticeship programs. So I was a trades instructor. And like I said, I realized that they weren't teaching shop in school anymore. And uh, I said, you know what, this is a resource that needs to be available for everybody, for homeowners who are graduating from high school, graduating from college. They don't have the skills that they need to maintain their own homes. And I said, I need to start making videos. I think there needs to be like a free resource for people because, um, you know, not everybody's coming to my classroom. And I figured I could do a classroom online and just really reach out and help people. So that's how I got started on YouTube. It just started off as a website. I needed to port in videos, and the easiest way to do that was on YouTube, and then it just developed a following. So life does not travel in a straight line, my friend. (laughs) It certainly doesn't because I don't think either one of us would have expected where we started uh, in the construction realm and to see where we are now, because it's it's so beneficial to me and I take so much pride and I'm so passionate about the YouTube community and trying to help others help others learn how to build and create because that is truly my my passion in life. And the fact that I able I'm able to do what I'm passionate about is extremely beneficial for me mentally and I'm so gratifying. So it is I, I love it. I agree. <laughs> Anyways, we so Martin, hopefully that uh, that answers your questions. So thank you so much. Oh, real, Leah, real quick. What is your most loved tool in your tool set? I got to tell you, I love my table saw. I just, there's, <laughs> it's just so much you can do with the table saw, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, that's it for me. Table saw is tops. Mm-hmm. Love it. Love it. Got another question uh, best tips to welding or excuse me, welding. Yes. Just for a few table legs, wanted to give it a shot and get over fear and all. Thanks. Well, Leah, I have done some welding. I certainly, I don't call myself a master welder. That's for certain, but, uh, I think you've probably done more welding than I have. So you want to take it? Well, what I would say is I would say start off low tier because, you know, there's MIG, there's TIG, there's stick, and then there's flux core welding. And that's the lowest level of welding that you could get involved in. (laughs) Oh, I'm so sorry. (laughs) That was my dog, everybody. Sorry about Zach. (laughs) Zach, come on. Oh, come on, Zach. Uh, Yeah, so um, flex core welding, and you can purchase a unit for a little bit of nothing. You probably go to Harbor Freight and find um, a flex core welder for about $90. Mm -hmm. And um, you can get an inexpensive uh, welding helmet. You know what, though? I I would say protect your eyes by the best welding helmet that you can afford. So I take back what I said about a welding helmet. Um, and you could get involved with, with welding for probably about, uh, I don't know, $160 once you buy, you know, you're going to need a table. But once you do one project, you'll want to do more. Mm-hmm. Then I would just encourage you to, um, you know, start watching YouTube videos on flex core welding. See, because the great thing about flex core welding is that it's easy to learn you don't need as much equipment as if, for example, you were doing TIG welding. TIG welding, you're dealing with gas and all like that. Uh, flex core welding, that is not the case. Um, and then I would say it's it's. I will say this: the downside to flex core welding is it it spits a little bit. You get a little bit of um. There's a little bit of cleanup to do with uh, flex core welding. It's not pretty. Yeah, it's not uh, like TIG. TIG. TIG welding <laughs> is pretty. You've got what they call stacked dimes. It looks nice. The weld does. But with um, a flex core, not so much. But once you get started with welding, 
you'll move on to other things. You'll go on the stick welding, then you'll probably move on the TIG welding. It's a valuable skill to have. So yeah. I, 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 you know, I encourage you to check it out. Yeah, no, I love the question. And it's definitely one of those things that I personally still want to learn more about. And again, just add on to those, add on those skill sets. Keep it That's going. Right. I always <laughs> encourage all my students to always get their, um, their welding certs because it doesn't really matter what, um, well, my students anyway, I, it didn't matter what apprenticeship program you were involved in, whether it's carpenter, um, um, iron worker, sheet metal worker, didn't matter. I always encourage folks to get their welding certs because it's just a valuable, valuable skill. Right. Mm -hmm. Love it. We got one for you, Leah, specifically dedicated to you. Hi, Leah. My hubby, <laughs> took... <laughs> All right. My hubby took a door off its hinges with his wheelchair. Can I use bamboo food skewers instead of toothpicks hollow core door three times it's it's or three times it's happened okay so i'm assuming it's because she's talking about where the screws are set into the door uh-huh and, <laughs> and, and, and you know you know we've done a TikTok on this with toothpicks but with not think, bamboo listen, food skewers i don't think there's anything wrong with using bamboo Food skewers. I think that's a great idea. I think it'll take up more space. Yeah. No, I it's think all so. about friction. It's all about friction and glue. Once that glue sets, the more friction that screw has, the better off you're going to be. So, yeah, that's what I would do. Yeah, more uh, yeah, power to you. There's two things I would definitely say is obviously, number one, make sure you use glue with the skewers. And two is, in all honesty, if this is a reoccurring problem and it's happened multiple times, I would suggest using longer screws. Yeah. So if it's, if it's actually the screw itself, those short little screws can only hold so much and become so strong. But if you use a longer screw that's actually drilling into the, uh, the framing of the doorway, that will really hold on to that door very, very nicely. And if it's the door that's coming off of the hinge, then you, I, I see what you're saying where it might be the hollow coreness. So obviously a longer screw might not work for a hollow core aspect. Yep. I'm with you, Brent. We got some great questions. I'm loving all these questions, by the way, Leah. We got some good ones. Buddy writes... Could you do a video on how to turn a porch roof to a deck? Ooh, interesting. That's interesting. If you do it, I'll come join you, Brent. I'll fly out and join <laughs> you with that one. Of course, you have to have the right house to do that. I know. That's the problem is that you got to find the right house to do that type of project because not all houses obviously have that capability to or need of doing so i will keep that in mind buddy for sure i will i assure you i will keep that in mind for future endeavors but as of right now that's not on uh, the uh, the list of projects <laughs> oh oh here we go back to uh, the door question bigger holes in door where screws were mm -hmm. makes life interesting yep understandably so I definitely uh, know that firsthand with a few different people in my family, but yeah, I would say the uh, the door aspect. You might, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say to change out the door because obviously that's definitely a a time consuming and expensive process. But uh, that might be something that you have to look down the road. But try the screwer thing first with the uh, with the glue, and hopefully that solves the problem. Oh, like installing rails. Okay, let's hear what. Oh, here we go. Here's a good question. What are your other favorite YouTube channels? Obviously, other than other than C Drain Drill, nothing. I mean, of course, C Drain Drill is everything. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about your channel, my friend. I was thinking about your channel as well. All right. <laughs> 
I want to know what you watch. I'm curious now. Uh, what do you watch? Oh man, there's I I have some unique channels in my repertoire, and the ones that I'm gonna actually shout out right now are are ones that are more well, just are just fun. So one that is actually a, has a small following, uh, but really enjoyed was uh, was Family Renovate. So Family. Um, and they renovate, it's actually spelled with an eight at the end. So that's actually a really fun channel where they actually have, it's two different families, they're coming together, they're remodeling a house, and I really enjoyed watching their process and they have just a fun energy to it. So I would suggest that one. Um, Corridor Crew, if uh, if you guys love movies, which I do, and in all honesty, I one thing that I truly miss right now is going to a movie theater. So one thing that I love watching is Corridor Crew, and they actually do some really amazing, detailed, uh, basically t tutorials on how things are being done in movies, whether it's special effects or uh, or stuntman aspects it's a really fun channel to watch uh, there's plenty of other out other ones that i watch out there that are diy centric there's another one that i just found actually recently just found and they're just blowing up right now which is amazing and they'll probably be at a hundred thousand in no time and they started a few months ago is bro builds Bro builds. Uh, I just found their channel, and they I are a super fun channel that I just recently came across, and they're exploding right now. So we'll see uh, if they continue to go that direction. <laughs> I think I've run across them. Yep. Uh, how about you, Leah? Any any channels you absolutely love watching? Well, B Y O T comes to mind. <laughs> I tell you what, I had to bring out my phone. I had to pull my phone out to look and see what, you know, what I watch. And uh, I have so many channels that I follow and it's a little embarrassing, you know? It's <laughs> hey, a, that means you're, that means you're just a, supporting the YouTube community. Well, okay. Off, offhand, I watch A Glimpse Inside. You know. You oh, know, I love Glimpse. Yeah. Chris from Glimpse Inside. I love that channel. Mm -hmm. um, I watch... Uh, a channel about um, interior design called Design to the Nines. Really um, interesting. Then I, I watch channels that have nothing to do with home improvement or Me building too. or Me anything too. like that. Um, there's this guy named Cash Peters. He's from um, the UK. And he's just funny to watch, you know. I get a real kick out of his stuff. Well, so so but, what, you know, is, that's it, just what is it exactly? What kind of channel Cash is it? Cash Peters? Yeah. He does. He, I'm not quite certain <laughs> what he does. I mean, I want to say that he's like a psychic, but he's not really a psychic. <laughs> it's just well, now strange. I have to look him up after this. After this live, I really definitely Cash him up. Peters. He's a funny, funny guy. He does a lot of political stuff, but um, it's political. It's political psychic stuff. It's just bizarre, <laughs> but he's funny, so that's why why I watch him. I always like a good laugh. Yep. But right. those are the those are the people that uh, come to mind. And then, of course, there are friends of ours like uh, Paul Peck with Drywall Tube, you know, and uh, Mitch. Uh, he's got his channel over on TikTok. That I love his channel. I know. know, right? They're so good. Goodly. I love them. What what what's Mitch's uh, TikTok channel called? Goodly, Goodly. Earth. Mm -hmm. He's a lot of fun to watch. So For yeah, sure. offhand, those are the people that that I watch on YouTube. Love it, love it. Here we go. Here's another question for: What would you recommend for a newbie buying a pre-cut shed from a big box store, or buying the material and doing everything myself? That's a good question, Michael. I like this question, Leah. What uh, what say you first off? This is what I will say. Believe it or not, I believe that a pre-cut shed will save you money. If you buy the materials yourself, it, it can get a little pricey. Of course, you know, then you can uh, modify. Well, 
You can build it to suit your own needs if you just buy the materials, draw up a design. It can be a lot of fun to do that way. And then you develop a lot of skills. So it all really kind of depends on what your aim is. Do you just want to throw it up, get it over with, have something to use for the, the spring and the summer? Then I would say go the pre-cut shed route. If you're really trying to build something and build up your skills as well. And maybe um, you want to be a little creative as well. Then I would say, you know, purchase the materials and uh, do something that uh, will really serve, serve your needs. But just keep in mind that it's going to cost you more money. It's going to cost you more money to go with something custom built. Yeah. And that's, it's so funny. This question gets brought up and you addressed it like that because I had the same exact uh, question broached to me earlier this week from a friend because she wants to build a pergola and she asked me to do it for her. And we started talking back and forth on what, uh, what she wanted, what her budget was and so forth. And exactly the same mindset of if, if it's, budget related and you have a finite budget just know that it's going to be cheaper to do a shed when it's pre-cut and prefabricated and you just have to assemble it together just because the materials alone especially right now with materials being so absorbently high the, the pre-built pre-cut aspect is going to save you not only money but time so just keep that in mind however you you know those sometimes are not the best looking products and they might not be the best quality sometimes as well. So that's also something you have to keep in mind and take into consideration because if you're looking for something that's a little more custom, a little bit that matches your house style, then obviously going down the rabbit hole of your own materials and so forth would be beneficial in that respect. But for a newbie, I would definitely push you towards a pre-cut shed aspect personally. Uh, well, first off, I just had to say thank you, Adam, because we had a nice little $3 donation. So thank you so much. And you are beautiful as well. <laughs> Let's see if we, we still have a few questions. Can I say hi to you? Um, Let's see here. Do you see any questions on your end, Leah, that you want to address? Here's a great question for you. It's about the recommendations to replace a window because I think you have a video that did very well about window replacement. Do you know who it's from? I'll bring it up. It's from a woman. From a woman. That's Oh, that's that's the name. Okay. <laughs> from a uh -huh. woman. Okay. Uh -huh. There we go. No, no, she's got another one before. Th oh, before that? Oh, no, wait. Yeah, she's got another one before yeah. that. Yeah, okay. Here we go. A woman, would <laughs> what would you recommend to replace a window from? That would be my recommendation, your video. Because <laughs> it's a good one, Dad. It is a good one. And obviously, there's different types of windows out there, especially depending on the style that you have. Uh, but personally, especially if it's an aluminum window, like as an aluminum frame window, there, I did an amazing video on the whole process of removing and installing a brand new uh, vinyl window or uh, just a, a normal window you'd pick up at Home Depot or Lowe's, that sort of thing. And it's very detail oriented. I actually encased the window around with trim and so forth. And it shows the entire process from start to finish. So hopefully that helps your journey on replacing the window. The, uh, let's see. I know we got some good questions out here still. Okay. We got buddy coming back. I'm trying to drill through an old toilet flange to put a universal one on, but it can't seem to drill through the old metal one. Any tips or any ideas or tips? Do I need a hammer drill? Leah, do you have any experience with this? You don't need a hammer drill. You know, they, they make a product that is um, repairs a bad to toilet flange without um, having to connect directly to the old one. 
it connects to the floor instead surrounding the old flange. And that would be my recommendation to you. You can get it at any big box store like Lowe's or Home Depot. They're easy. It's like, I think it's a split flange is what it is. Mm -hmm. And so that would be my recommendation to you. Forget about drilling through the old flange. You don't need to do that. Um, that's that's what I, I would personally suggest. Yeah, I think that's, that's good ass or obviously uh, good information. And personally, I haven't had to... Uh, experience that heartache, unfortunately, or luckily for me, but uh, hopefully uh, that does help. So thank you, Leah, for that one. Another good question. What kind of maintenance does a table saw have? I don't have one yet, but we'll be getting one soon. So uh, personally on my end, in all honesty, zero maintenance other than getting new blades every once in a while. So that's the beauty about a table saw. It's a very functional, an extremely functional tool that's very simplistic in all reality because all it is is a table with a saw blade and a motor and it goes that way. So in all honesty, the, the only maintenance I have ever had with my table saw is just replacing the blade. Now, I guess it would depend on what kind of table saw you have too. I mean, if you have a cabinet style table saw like I do, uh, the cabinet fills up with sawdust and I have to vacuum that out. And then you also have to be concerned about the belt too. So mm -hmm. it, de it depends if you have direct drive, do you have a belt driven uh, table saw? Those things matter. But that <laughs> you're, you're right, Brent, it's just basically the saw blade. Right. And I mean, we just have to give it up to Leah because Aww. sometimes you just get questions. Sometimes you just get statements like this and just, it's heartwarming and because we all love Leah. Well, Trust thank me. you so much. That That's so sweet of you to say. Thank you. Thank you for uh, commenting like that. Thank you. Yeah, no, we appreciate that. Dude, I have to ask you about your lawn from video number eight. Oh, so long ago. What happened after? Did the weeds come back? Say Some say that removing slash tilling the weeds won. Uh, so good question. And in all honesty, I am planning on doing a, a, a revamp and a discussion or a new video this summer on my lawn and how it looks as well as the upkeep that it's needed. So in all honesty, it's, it's green. It looks good. It is not as pristine and beautiful as it once was. Yes, there are weeds, but in all honesty, there's very few weeds. That's, that's in all honesty, my last uh, thing that I'm worried about at the moment. Right now, it's actually quite uh, bumpy when you're walking on it. And because my dog, when he was very young, decided to destroy the sprinkler system, oh. the sprinkler system is not working at the moment. So uh, it's very green right now, but in the summer, it will definitely become... Uh, a little darker if I don't get the sprinkler system up and running soon. So I will keep that in mind. And good question because the lawn itself looks great, looks amazing for the most part. Just there are definitely things I want to improve upon it. And I am planning on doing a video sometime uh, within the spring, summer time. So keep that in mind and look out for that video. Did you watch that video by the way, Leah? Have you seen that one of mine? I haven't seen that one. I love the one you did with the the artificial turf. I know that one's that's still, the one. That one's I, still blowing up right now, which is amazing. I've shown a number of my friends that video. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. What are your recommendations for replacing a bathroom window from the 1970s? That outside of the house is siding. I think so it was again, the same, <laughs> same person, same, somewhat the same uh, question uh, a woman has asked. And yes, same exact thing that I'm going to say is I'm going to direct you to my video because it will explain the whole process. But I should explain the process of cutting around the window, removing that old siding, and then removing the actual old window itself with the frame, especially if it's a single pane window aluminum frame. You want to get that out of the house and then replace it with a double, at least a double pane window with, uh, with a better quality seal. And then you can install trim around it so it is a nice cohesive look versus 
uh, a jumbled mess of what it was uh, when you installed the new window. <laughs> any uh, any tips on that, Leah? That you want to add? I think that your your video is excellent, and I I would just highly recommend it. Okay, and we're coming. I can't believe we're already coming up on an hour. So. Leah, again, thank you so much for joining us. I will let's take a couple more questions and then we can uh, say adieu for today. Let's see here. Last question: Two repairs, a two foot and a half foot, one foot hole in drywall. Drywall. Can you buy sm just small amounts of drywall? A long story. <laughs> I opened it. <laughs> long story short, right? So, you know, I have seen at uh, at Home Depot small two foot by two foot sections of drywall. That's I haven't seen them everywhere, but I have seen them in the past and. Uh, I would suggest trying to go down that route if it's a, a large enough hole. If they're smaller, or I guess you did say that they're two foot by half foot. So those are sizable holes. So yes, they do sell smaller pieces of drywall, not the eight foot by four foot standard sizes, but uh, they don't always have them. So keep that in mind as well as just ask the question when you walk into a store. Lee, do you have any, anything to add on that one? I mean, you you nailed it. Have, have you seen those small sections? I have. And I, I, to tell you the truth, they're very, very convenient. They're convenient, but, of course, they're expensive. Sometimes, you know what, to tell you the truth, I've gone to um, Home Depot and I've gone to Lowe's and I've taken my utility knife and my T-square and just purchased a sheet and cut it right there in the car, you know. Yep. Not in the car, but you know, my van, cut it down the size because it's always going to be cheaper. It's it's going to be less expensive to buy a whole sheet, but those smaller sheets are very convenient. Yep, exactly. So next question, I made it in uh, a panel and I wanted to know what's the best way to hang it to the ceiling without any holes. I tried indoor mounting tape, but it fell a couple weeks later. Hmm. That's an interesting question. Lydia, you have any uh, experience? I'm trying, to, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out why he's got an acoustic panel without, without a grid. To, I guess it's a gridless panel. It's probably a factory edged acoustic panel that maybe it fell in the center or of maybe the, it's like a one of those acoustic foam panels but those foam panels generally are resting in a grid mm -hmm. unless it's directly glued my i guess think that's, it, i think that's it, what he was trying to do he was it, trying to mount it via tape versus something versus like actually making a hole in the drywall it's not it's a, it's a acoustic panel ceiling probably resting on furring strips that you at one time i don't know i'm guessing that it's a replacement one replacement panel those no, I panels think yeah i don't think it's one of those grid things i think it's an actual normal ceiling that he's trying to attach an acoustic panel to which is why he specifically said he made an acoustic panel versus it doesn't you know, have to but it doesn't have to be a grid it could be furring strips that the panels are stapled to some of them are glued to the ceiling and so i thought he was replacing just one panel that was damaged i don't know i don't i'm, I'm not certain what he he's stl asking. do you want to just comment real quickly what the scenario is a bit more and we'll try and get to your question here by the end because we do want a little bit more information on that process before we start jabbering away at the solution for it. Let's see if we have any other questions over here. Restore, thank you both so much. Peel has scrap. Oh, here. 
follow-up question quickly. So did the Rainbird DIY system hold up or would you recommend a more traditional sprinkler system install? Well, in all honesty, it did hold up until my dog got to it. So until my dog got to it, it worked, it worked great, it worked fine. But once Kona got to it and destroyed it, then not so much. So I cannot blame, <laughs> I cannot blame Rainbird for uh, Kona, but I would like to. <laughs> Why is it your hose stronger than uh, my uh, my eighty pound dog? But uh, he definitely destroyed the Rainbird system very quickly, <laughs> and it did not hold up. But in all honesty, before we got the dog, beautiful, worked great, and I would still recommend Rainbird. So keep that in mind. <laughs> okay, here we go. We got back back. Yeah, it's a acoustic foam panel for sound absorption. Oh. I wanted to mount it to the oh. ceiling without a lot of damage to the ceiling. So you were right on, my friend. Yeah, I I thought I had the right mindset there. So what I would do. There's a couple different ways you could do it, but personally, the one thing that I know that really doesn't do much damage to a surface if you're trying to peel it off is uh, is actually silicone. Like I've used silicone numerous times, and it is very strong when it uh, when it actually dries. And personally, what I would do is just put a couple dollops, a couple small little amounts of silicone, and you can actually buy magnets. So buy a couple magnets that are just cylinder round magnets Love and attach that. the magnets to the silicone, or or if it's strong enough, grab a magnet that has an adhesive back to it and then install those onto the ceiling as well as the acoustic panel and try and hold it up. And Because those acoustic panels should not be very shouldn't be very heavy you know if it's if you're holding it up with tape originally and the tape's coming off that means most likely the tape's just being worn down after a while and but this but the the foam panel is fairly light so keep that in mind and i personally would just use some type of attachment via magnets on the acoustical panel as well as on the ceiling that's a great idea brent Hopefully. Any uh, any suggestions there? No, I like your idea. I love it. <laughs> Good. Good. Look at that. Boom. Let's see. I think that might be our last question. I think that's uh, that's it for the day. Anyways, in any case, you all, thank you all so much for joining us today. We had plenty of people throughout this entire live stream. So I love the fact that we're able to not only help people within our own videos that we do every single week, but on a fun one on or two on one-on-one you know, -on -one slash any, whatever basis you call this, but just inevitably, no matter what, we love the YouTube community. Thank you, Leah, so much for joining me today. And thank you all for joining us because Truly, I know Leah very well, and we personally just love helping others learn how to build and create, and that's why we do what we do. So thank you all so much, and hopefully you guys all enjoy next week's video. Thank you. Bye, everybody.